Assad leaders promise billions for Syrian refugees, but tens of thousands more are fleeing right now. Russian bombing and heavy fighting in northern Syria are driving at least 70,000 desperate people towards the Turkish border. Also tonight, the businessman shot dead in a raid on his warehouse. Desperate efforts to save the latest whale to wash up on a Norfolk beach. And triumph for the injured war vets in their battle with the ocean. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale and Mark Austin. Good evening. World leaders today pledged £7 billion to help Syrian refugees in the Middle East, with David Cameron saying it would save lives and provide urgent medical care and shelter. At the same conference in London came a warning that the situation is about to get much worse. Turkey's Prime Minister says Russian bombing and heavy fighting in the northern Syrian city of Aleppo is forcing at least 70,000 refugees to flee towards his country, and that will only create yet more need for humanitarian help. Paul Davis reports. Before a word was spoken, these were the images shown to world leaders to remind them why they'd been called to London. When the words came, they were no less shocking. If people are reduced to eating grass and leaves and killing uh, stray animals in order to survive, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, that is something that should tear at the conscience of all civilized people. The world had been asked to dig deep, to offer help and hope to a generation of Syrian people who've lost their homes and the means of supporting themselves and educating their children. Some 18 million people need humanitarian assistance both inside and outside Syria. Today's conference was hoping to raise five and a half billion pounds the UN says is needed to help them. But three previous conferences have fallen well short. Last year, not even half the target was reached. After announcing more British aid, David Cameron asked others to follow or risk embarrassing questions about why they'd failed to help. We think of our children and our grandchildren and what we will say to them when they say to us in the future, what did you do when the world faced this Syrian refugee crisis, when so many suffered, when so many were killed? By the end of the day, £7 billion had been pledged to help Syria's displaced, the biggest amount raised in a day for a single cause, said the UN. But aid alone won't solve this humanitarian crisis. These pictures show the latest bombardment of rebel-held Aleppo inside Syria. Turkey's Prime Minister said even as delegates were meeting in London, tens of thousands more refugees from Aleppo were heading for Turkey's already overcrowded camps. My mind is not now in London, but on, in our border, how to relocate these new people coming from Syria. The UN is tonight urging Russia to use its influence to halt the violence against civilians, which is driving this crisis to ever more desperate levels. Paul Davis, ITV News. And that money and assistance cannot come soon enough for refugees in places like the sprawling Zatari camp in Jordan. Around 100,000 Syrians call it home, among them seven young brothers who have been left to survive on their own. Their mother is seeking asylum in Germany in the hope of bringing them there. The boys told our Middle East correspondent Geraint Vincent about their hopes and fears for the future. On the waste ground, between his camp and the local town, a teenage refugee is on the phone to his mother. Khaled can get a good signal here to receive the video message his mum wants to send. He heads back to the shelter where he lives with his six younger brothers. They haven't seen their mum since she left for Germany five months ago. They crowd around the screen. God willing, she tells them, we'll be reunited soon. When the family left Syria three years ago, the boy's father stayed behind. So in a camp which is now home to 100,000 people, the brothers have been fending for themselves. 
يعني شلون بقول لك موافق ومانيش موافق موافق انه من ناحيه انه اللي بيروح لغات بقرا بتعلم حياه احسن من هون مانيش موافق انه بالنسبه للطريق طريق خطر بحر يعني كثير ناس عم تغرق حسين سماره حسين سماره ما خبا حسين سماره <laughs> Hussein is the youngest brother. He lost an eye in Syria and his injury was treated here. So Zatari has provided refuge, but little else. Their childhoods are casualties of war. And what would you say to your mum if she was here now? <coughs> he will uh, say hello to her and there is an in, in, in Arabic he says. In Germany, the boy's mother, Wadha, is waiting for her residency application to be approved and for her sons to be allowed to join her. But with so many refugees now in the country, it's a slow process. I As she watched the messages her sons had sent back to her, what her wept. She won't be allowed back to Jordan, so she's relying on the German authorities to reunite her with the boys. But the world wants to spend its aid money building a future for Syrian refugees in the camps on their country's borders. So the brothers carry on living in the shack they call home, somewhere between hope and despair. Geraint Vincent, ITV News, Zartary. Well, our international affairs editor, Raggy Omar, joins us now from the conference. Now, Raggy, lots of money's been pledged for camps like the one we saw in Geraint's report, but how much difference is that, if any, will that money actually make? Well, it'll help the refugees who are in countries like Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey to be able to plan for the longer term. So not just to be fed and housed, but to be educated and to be able to work. But we have to actually spell this out for what it really is, Mary, because if these refugees in countries like Lebanon, Jordan and Turkey, and those countries said we cannot cope with the numbers that we're having to house and, and accommodate, if those refugees aren't able to be supported, the consequence will be they will make the same journey that Wadha made and her sons are hoping to make here to Europe, which is something that European countries don't want. So it's about helping countries in the region help Syrian refugees. And what it, this conference doesn't uh, make clear, of course, and cannot make clear, is that there is no humanitarian settlement to the conflict in Syria. It has to be a political one. And on that, we're as far away from it as ever. Hey, Raggy, you're in central London. Thank you. Two gunmen are still on the run tonight after shooting dead a grandfather during a raid on his business. 56-year-old Akhtar Javid was shot in the head during the attempted robbery at his food and drink distribution firm in Birmingham. Detectives say the warehouse was specifically targeted from the scene. Ben Chapman reports. He was a father of four and a businessman, the owner of a catering supplies company who'd only moved to Birmingham a few months ago. But last night, Akhtar Javid lost his life defending his premises from armed robbers. He was found shot outside his warehouse just a few minutes after someone inside had called 999 to report that two masked men had burst in. What they witnessed is now a crucial part of the police investigation. Uh, there were a number of staff members in the premises at the time uh, that we're working with this morning, both in terms of trying to understand what they can, can offer in terms of evidence, but also offering support, as you can imagine, obviously a clearly traumatic incident. Step by step, police today began the slow but urgent process of tracking down Mr Javid's killers as they remain on the run. Forensic tests will try to determine what kind of gun they used, while detectives attempt to trace the getaway car they fled in. But above all, they and Mr Javid's family will want to know why he and his business were specifically targeted. It is almost exactly 24 hours since his killers made their getaway, disappearing off into what is a pretty quiet industrial area at this time of night. A full day on since this robbery went so badly wrong, these two masked men are still at large. Ben, thank you very much.
The Bank of England has held interest rates at 0.5%. The Governor, Mark Carney, slashed the UK's growth outlook, but he said it was more likely than not that rates would need to rise over the next two years. United Nations lawyers have decided that WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is being unlawfully detained. Mr Assange is staying in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, fighting extradition to Sweden on sexual assault allegations. The government says he will still be arrested if he leaves. Now, there is a desperate struggle tonight to save another sperm whale stranded on a beach in Norfolk. Rescuers are trying to get it back out to sea, but they'd say it is probably too late. The mammal washed ashore this morning in Hunstanton before the first of six whales was stranded two weeks ago. Three more whales, believed to be from the same pod, were found at Skegness and Seacroft. A fifth washed up on Wainfleet marshes in Lincolnshire. From Hunstanton, Nina Nanar has the latest. This is no place for such a beautiful creature and no one knows for sure why he has ended up here on a shallow stretch of beach in North Norfolk and in truth dying. After an hour like this it is rare for sperm whales to survive. 20 tonnes of weight, too much to bear out of water, the creature too big to be moved to safety. Anita found him on the beach this morning. I went, went up to him, uh, stood at the front end of him and spoke to him. He definitely knew I was there because he started to breathe quicker, whether that was stress or whether he knew it, someone was with him. Um, and since then he's deteriorated rapidly. Well, the tide has been coming in for a little while now. It's high tide in around half an hour. The whale is nearly totally submerged, but you can still see it splashing out there in the water, trying desperately to get back out there. But the fear is that as the tide comes in, the whale will be pushed this way once more. 29 whales have so far been stranded across Europe's beaches in the last fortnight. And marine experts say without more detailed research, we'll never find out why. Up in the North Sea, past Scotland, uh, something could have happened that made them make an error judgment and they've turned into the shallow waters. Um, no one actually knows. There are strandings throughout history of sperm whales, but not in this number. Investigators will now try to establish whether it was an error of judgment in pursuit of food in the North Sea or some man-made activity that brought this whale and so many others disastrously close to shore. Well, the whale has now been stranded out on the beach behind me for much longer than 12 hours. But tonight, as I speak, it is still alive out there in the dark. And later on tonight, a cordon will be erected around the animal. And that's really to keep members of the public away from it, uh, really, so that it has some dignity as the inevitable happens. Another worrying point, these sperm whales, whales travel in pods perhaps of up to 30. So maybe this isn't the last of these mysterious and very, very sad stories. Nina, thank you. Right, still to come on the ITV Evening News, the rural bus services campaigners say are at risk of being wiped out. And the amputee veterans celebrating after making Atlantic rowing history. Those stories and more after the break. Join us then. Welcome back. A pregnant woman from Spain has been diagnosed with the Zika virus after travelling to one of the affected countries. The woman is now under medical supervision after returning from a trip to Colombia. In other developments, Brazil reported a case of the virus being passed by a blood transfusion and the UK may start spraying aircraft flying in from countries affected by the outbreak. Well, as Zika spreads, the race is on to develop a vaccine. Little is known about the virus, but one laboratory in Glasgow University is leading the way. Our health editor, Rachel Younger, was given an exclusive look inside. Meet the Aedes aegypti mosquito, Zika carrier and resident of Glasgow, although thankfully the only way it can survive here is in a heated lab. But almost 5,000 miles from Brazil, scientists in Scotland are trying to counter what's now a global emergency. I think we really have this desire and this um, common goal between the people who work on this that we come up with a solution because we, we look at it and um, we are parents oft enough as well and we want, to, we want to make sure that we can do our best to help the people in affected areas. They need to understand a virus that strikes the most defenceless 
seeming to damage the brains of babies while they're still in the womb. Like Ebola's victims before them, it's their fate that's driving scientists to search for a vaccine. But while Ebola was already feared, this time they had no clue. With Ebola, it was already on the radar because it could be a potential bioterrorist threat, um, and so vaccines were already in the pipeline. With Zika, it's come completely out of nowhere. We, um, we had known virtually nothing about it, and we did not anticipate that this was going to be um, such a wide, widespread outbreak, and so it will take quite a long time for us to develop a vaccine. What they want to work out, too, is how to stop the virus from spreading. In this lab, they're trying to isolate genes within the mosquito to see if they can be modified to stop them acting as carriers. It's the female of the species that does the damage. They're the only ones that bite, but they're also monogamous, which is why in Brazil they're releasing genetically engineered sterile versions of the male to try and diminish the population. If it all feels rather distant, the breeding tanks here are a reminder that when summer arrives in parts of southern Europe, the Aedes mosquito will come with it. While a vaccine may be a distant prospect, the threat is growing closer. Rachel Younger, ITV News, Glasgow. Now, there was a warning today that many rural bus services across England and Wales face being wiped out by council budget cuts. The campaign for better transport says almost 2,500 routes have been axed or reduced since 2010 and further spending cuts will only make things worse. Rupert Evelyn reports from Malmesbury and Wiltshire, one of the affected areas. These rural services don't just connect villages with towns, they connect their passengers with their needs for life. The number 92 in Wiltshire runs hourly, and for many on board it is a necessity. Even the suggestion of cutbacks or service reduction is unpopular. It really devastating because um, I'm now a widow and my, I haven't got a husband to drive me around, I don't drive myself, but I have lots of things that I'm involved with. What would you do instead? Um, I'd have to stay at university longer, so I'd come back home later. Seeing that they're trying to get public transport, like, use it more um, for the environment, I think it's pretty critical. Wiltshire Council are consulting on the shape of its rural bus service in the future. The precise number of services and how they'll be affected is not yet known, but one thing is for sure, the cuts are coming. Across the country, the Campaign for Better Transport says subsidies have fallen by £78 million since 2010, with another £27 million under threat this year. Nationally, the government says it's protected £250 million in bus funding, but as in Wiltshire, it's local cuts that will bite. Oh, it's, it's essential for some people, people who haven't got cars. We've got to accept there'll be cuts to our budgets. We want to end up with a level of transport that we can sustain for four, five, up to ten years. However keen passengers are to hang on to their services, all the signs are that the timetable as they know it is likely to get slashed. Rupert Evelyn, ITV News, Wiltshire. Well, rail passengers don't normally have much to cheer about either, but there was a pleasant surprise for some lucky commuters at St Pancras Station in London. Yes, it really is him. Sir Elton John played a rendition of Tiny Dancer on a piano that he had donated to the station. Before leaving, the musician signed it and wrote the words, Enjoy this piano. It's a gift. At St Pancras, so it must be his favourite track. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, a group of wounded military veterans are celebrating tonight after becoming the first all-amputee team to row across the Atlantic. The men arrived in the Caribbean this afternoon after a punishing 47-day trip from the Canary Islands. They told Neil Connery about their epic adventure. Rowing into the record books, the first all-amputee crew to power their way across the Atlantic. Finishing after 3,000 gruelling miles in Antigua this afternoon. The pride of these four ex-servicemen clear to see as they were given a hero's welcome. But their final hours of rowing proved to be some of the toughest. I genuinely thought we were going to miss the island. The weather that came through last night really did throw us off a lot. It was probably one of the worst 12-hour periods we've had at sea and it was on the last night. So really, really happy to be here and so happy that everybody's in one piece and, well, the pieces that they have anyway and safe and sound.
families and friends lining the quayside as the crew celebrated with a well-earned drink. They spoke of their mission and their warm Caribbean welcome. There is a life beyond injury and the likes, and to just see the friendly faces and the welcome greetings and just the <laughs> the, the epic welcome essentially that we had was, was just was so amazing for us. 47 days of exhausting effort and determination now culminating in a moment they'll never forget. Their epic achievement across the Atlantic, an inspiration to so many. Neil Connery, ITV News. And that is properly good, epic. Good for them. Talking of which, Julie Etchingham will be here with news at 10. But from uh, <laughs> all of us, have a very good evening. Bye-bye.